Hare Om Namaha. The true believers in powerful Eastern cults advocating liberation from samsara and so-called ISKCON certainly qualifies, are convinced that remaining in the good graces of and link to their institution and its governing body is sine qua non for any chance at ultimate personal deliverance. They believe that any preaching which is not approved by their institution and its governing body not only cannot be considered a vehicle for liberation, but is instead leading the wayward former devotee to the path of perdition. Such a fanatical mentality of the true believers is not a rare trait. It is found in every category of cult throughout the world. It is found in a pr prominent analogical Western cult. It's found throughout the three Abrahamic religions. It's found in institutions led by charismatic wildcard gurus and found also in counter-cultural organizations. They may not call it samsara, they may not call it mukti. Combined with the emotion attached to it, they may not even call it guru parampara. But with that emotion attached to it, it's all pervasive, all pervading in occult societies, that fanaticism. It's even found in some prosaic organizations. The allure of fanaticism, the mentality of the true believer going all in, all the chips in to the middle, is the default of Kali Yuga. The cult of so-called ISKCON is a deviation from the Guru Parampara, which it falsely claims to represent. Yet, it is worse than that. It is an oligarchy that in some ways follows the path of many previous infamous cults in the West. Its power node is the GBC, and the GBC mystique is dependent upon its own hierarchy, its own ritual, and of course its own dogma. How it operates has been recognized previously. One such example is Adolf Hitler. He picked up on the method and commented as expressed in his well-known book Mein Kampf. Quote, there is one dangerous element and that is the element I have copied from them. They form a sort of priestly nobility. They have developed an esoteric doctrine, not merely formulated, but imparted through the medium of symbols and mysterious rites in degrees of initiation. The hierarchical organization and the initiation through symbolic rites by working on the imagination through the magic of symbols." Unquote. His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada hoped that his GBC men would all become qualified as genuine gurus. This is well established. That is not the issue. The issue is whether or not they were able to actually please him enough so that he empowered them in that way. History has proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, that they did not please him to any significant extent. Indeed, they quite often displeased him. Thus, when 1978 rolled around, they remained just as unqualified to be genuine initiating spiritual masters as they were before that. Some background concerning that GBC is required here, and it, that background consists of relevant facts about Srila Prabhupada, about the GBC formulated and formed previously by Siddhanta Sarasvati, his guru, 
and some major events in the history of the governing body of so-called ISKCON. Now, as you all know, Prabhupada's godbrothers never recognized him as the successor. And they believed that the term Prabhupada was reserved for Siddhanta Sarasvati. As such, although they may not have always said it, they considered Prabhupada to be an offender. But the fact is that Prabhupada was a Mahabhagavat, fully God-realized, and a Shaktyavesh avatar. This is far, far beyond and above the status of a regular guru. Now, returning to the topic of the GBC and some background history directly or indirectly connected to it, Prabhupada rejected many of his godbrothers when they imitated Acharya, capital A, against their founder's orders, the order of Siddhanta Sarasvati, and fought in the courts over the properties, thus defeating the mission. In particular, this refers to Ananta Vasudev and Kunjababu, the latter eventually taking the title of Bhukti Vilas Tirta. Prabhupada called the Gaudiya Mat Asara, which means useless, in one of his purports, due to the vitriolic and at times violent split between the above mentioned factions headed by Ananta Vasudeva and Kunjababu. The following is from the purport to Chaitanya Charitamrita. Adi Lila, Chapter 12, Text 8, which substantiates this fact. Quote, One party strictly followed the instructions of Bhukti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, but another group created their own concoction about executing his desires. Bhukti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, at the time of his departure, requested all his disciples to form a governing body and conduct missionary activities cooperatively. They split into two factions. Consequently, both factions were asara or useless." Unquote. Almost all of the leading men of Gaudiya Mutt and Gaudiya Mission, if not actually all of them, rejected Prabhupada when he made Westerners his initiated disciples and assumed that exalted title. His divine grace did not receive that title from his own men. As mentioned, although his godbrothers gave him the deserved title of Bhaktivedanta, they did not recognize him as Prabhupada. A faction of them, two factions, imitated Acharya, but Prabhupada was Acharya, capital A. He became a founder Acharya of a new branch of Lord Chaitanya's Tree of Devotional Service, a branch that is currently hanging by a thread. In no small part, it is in that precarious position due to the deviations of the power node of so-called ISKCON, the vitiated GBC. Siddhanta Sarasvati formed his managing body and named it in a rather unique way. At that time, in the first half of the 20th century, the centralized railroad conglomerate in India was the most well-known organization on the subcontinent. It was managed by what was called the Governing Body Commission. Siddhanta Sarasvati, Prabhupada's spiritual master, simply adopted that same name. His commission consisted of 13 original members, all very influential and well-known throughout Gaudiya Their relationship with the presidents of the individual centers throughout India is not exactly clear, but it does not have to be. Our Prabhupada named his advisory body the Governing Body Commission by adopting the same label 
It was as simple as that. The Gaudium Ut governing body cracked very early on in its very brief history. Shortly after Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati left physical manifestation on the first day of 1937, the issue of how his movement was to be spiritually guided came to the fore. There were two obvious factions in that GBC, one led by Ananta Vasudev and the other led by Kunjababu. It was proposed as a resolution that Ananta Vasudev be made the new Acharya of the Gaudiamat, in effect replacing Siddhanta Sarasvati in that exalted position. This was vehemently resisted by the other faction. A vote was taken. The faction in favor of Ananta Vasudev prevailed, eight to five. By the way, Swami B. R. Sridhar, a member of that commission, voted in favor of that proposal and was part of that Ananta Vasudev faction, a big part. The five members led by Kunjababu broke away and took control of the Mayapur temple next to the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The Ananta Vasudev faction, on the other hand, took control of the opulent Calcutta center, which included the printing press. These factions, in due course, went to court and for the most part became bitter enemies. Prabhupada remained aloof, and he refers to this split when he wrote in that purport to Chaitanya Charitamrita previously cited, Adi Lila, chapter 12, verse 8, that the mission was defeated and the Gaudiya Mutt was rendered asara or useless by that schism centering around which so-called Acharya would be the supreme leader. Prabhupada particularly mentions that both camps selected Acharyas to allegedly head the mission, but that was not according to the order of Siddhanta Sarasvati. This fact was in that same purport cited previously in our presentation. In other words, by selecting two Acharyas, capital A, the factions deviated and disobeyed the order of the previous Acharya, capital A, Siddhanta Sarasvati, thus both becoming Asara or useless. Now in so-called ISKCON, in its GBC mystique, there are elements in common with that previous governing body of Siddhanta Sarasvati, but there are also notable differences. Just because Prabhupada, following in his spiritual master's footsteps, adopted the same label for his advisory board, does not mean that it was meant to operate as a governing unit despite quote-unquote governing being included in its title. That title has just been explained to all of you. It was for the railroads of India in the 20th century and it meant one thing there. However, its historical context being adopted by Prabhupada had nothing to do with it becoming a domineering governor of his movement. Pay no attention to narratives that try to wrench out anything different from this. Srila Prabhupada's primary intention for his GBC was just the opposite of any mandate for it to govern. He wanted the GBC man to function as advisor to the temple presidents. He wanted them to function, each GBC man, to function as an advisor to the temple presidents in his respective zone and to encourage the presidents. And when he saw some area needing improvement, 
that GBC man to advise them to make that improvement. The GBC men were to become the chief conduits to and from Prabhupada and thus relay his latest instructions, directions, intentions, and ideas. Among other benefits, this would then free him from having to answer many daily letters from his temple presidents, which had been the case during the previous years. After all, by the early 70s, the movement was growing at an astounding pace. So there were more presidents at more ever-expanding centers, and thus more letters coming to him. Prabhupada wanted to be free from the management. As such, he delegated much of those previous responsibilities to his GBC men, as per the design of that commission upon its creation. In other words, the GBC was not meant to be an overlord. We are going to substantiate this very quickly. However, being an overlord is exactly what it became. Just four months after his divine grace, grace left the scene in mid-November 1977. Indeed, one of the 11 pretender Mahabhagavats pushed hard to implement cult passports in which a devotee had to receive a stamp of approval on his or her passport from the current temple president, governing body commissioner, or sannyasi, whose party he was on, in order to relocate from one temple to the next. That resolution was not implemented, but the mere fact that it was even proposed is ample evidence of just how important it was for the zonal imposition to secure complete control of the devotees at large serving in the temples. The real workers were the rank and file, and most of them did not see, or at least in the beginning years, did not see how insidious was the greed, anger, strife, and bickering integral to the GBC takeover. Consider this excerpt from a letter to one of his first GBC appointees dated September 9th, 1972. Quote, You say that amongst the elder disciples there are still symptoms of greed, anger, strife, bickering, etc., but you are one of them. You are one of the old students, so you fall in that group. So the fighting is among that group, not amongst the real workers. Unquote. There's a bit of irony in this particular excerpt, but to discuss that would be tangential. As such, we shall leave it be. But those of you who know the history know what I'm referring to here. To reiterate, the GBC was not meant for becoming some kind of supreme controller. Ah, now we get to the heart of it. Consider this lengthy and important excerpt from a letter to the Temple President of Bombay dated August 12, 1971. Quote, GBC does not mean to control a center. GBC means to see that the activities of a center go on nicely. I do not know why Tamal is exercising his absolute authority. That is not the business of GBC. The President treasurer and secretary are responsible for managing the center. GBC is to see that things are going on nicely, but not to exert absolute authority. That is not in the power of GBC. Tamal should not do like that. The GBC men cannot impose anything on the men of a center without consulting all of the GBC members first. A GBC member cannot go beyond the jurisdiction of his power. We are in the experimental stage, but in the next meeting of the GBC members, they should form a constitution how the GBC members manage the whole affair. It is a fact that the local president is not under the control 
of the GVC, unquote. The governing body, even while it was bona fide, was never meant to become an institutional leviathan. Yet due to the overlording propensity intrinsic to the conditioned soul, that conditioned soul is not really engaging in Buddha yoga. The imitation GBC becomes the astral egregor. Its gross body consists of individuals who perhaps unwittingly, at least some of them, are trying to turn the manifest governing body into a monster. The excerpt we have just read to the president of Bombay proves that idea of GBC as the controller, a wrong idea, and every and all actions connected to implementing it to be not only wrong but against the directive and interests of the founder. Nevertheless, it was already gaining traction before Prabhupada departed. And remember, that letter was written in the early 70s. A fanatics should be differentiated from the rank and file in his movement, the real workers. The fanatics became easily involtuated by the groupthink of an emerging GBC Leviathan. It was the seed of the weed that eventually would strangle his movement after he left us when he could no longer check all of those deviations. Now let us return to a threadbare analysis of that letter that I've just read to the Bombay president. The very first sentence establishes that the GBC was never meant to be the controller of the movement. That idea of it being a controller is not part of its original protocol. It was never Prabhupada's intention, and this is made clear. The second sentence establishes what the GBC was meant to do. Its man in each zone was meant to be an overseer to see that everything in all of the temples in his zone was going on nicely. The third sentence, indirectly, establishes that the GBC is not the final authority. This is made specifically clear in its original charter known as the Direction of Management. The ultimate authority was His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada. It is made even more clear here, although you could argue that it's only referring to TKG, it would automatically do so, because at that time TKG was the GBC for Bombay. The complaint that elicited Prabhupada's response in, in this letter that we read to his Bombay president was a complaint from that president in Bombay against that particular GBC man, TKG. Next, the excerpt establishes that the GBC is not actually involved at all in the management of any center, what to speak of governing any of them. Again, that the word governing is in the title of the GBC is simply because it was in the title of Siddhanta Sarasvati's GBC, who took it from India's railroad conglomerate. <laughs> Next, in that loaded excerpt from the letter to the Bombay president, it is established beyond doubt that the GBD, GBC does not have absolute authority. How could it? It did not consist of pure devotees on the absolute plane. Prabhupada was the only one who had absolute authority as the Uttama Uttikari. Indeed, Prabhupada specifically states in this excerpt that it is not within the power of the GBC, what to speak of any GBC man, to exert absolute authority over any center in his zone. Next we find that if a GBC wants to impose something on a temple president against his wishes, it requires a convocation with the whole GBC in order to do so. Obviously, if everything was done fairly in such a convocation on the up and up, 
the president would not only be allowed, but he would be encouraged to make his counter-presentation to the conclave. To impose something on a temple president means that he is against what a specific GBC is attempting to impose on him and his center. One GBC man cannot do it, according to this letter's excerpt. The whole GBC is required by vote to concur. The follow-up is that a GBC man cannot go beyond the jurisdiction of his power which is obviously very limited. That overall GBC power is limited, that fact is thus reinforced very clearly in the excerpt from the letter. Arguably, the most shocking statement in the excerpt is that the GBC in the 70s was nothing more than an attempt. That it was in the experimental stage Remember, in April of 1972, Prabhupada suspended the GBC and its activities. That act indicated logically that Prabhupada could suspend and disband it completely at any time. And many of us now wish that he had chosen to do so. The whole excerpt is summed up in the following way, quote, it is a fact that the local president is not under the control of the GBC, unquote. Tatvamasi. Let us now proceed to four other excerpts from letters by his divine grace to his temple presidents at various centers or to commissioners during the 70s when the GBC was still functioning under his supervision, at least to some extent. One note about all four of these excerpts. Although the theme in each of them is similar, there is one sentence in every one of these excerpts which is exactly the same. Hopefully you will hear and recognize it as your host speaker reads each excerpt. We shall have more to say about it in subsequent commentary here. So let us now proceed to each of the four excerpts in chronological order. In a letter to his temple president at the major center of Great Britain, dated January 1st, 1974, Prabhupada commented, quote, however, at the Bhaktivedanta Manor, as anywhere, the local president is in charge. That is Mukunda. The reason why there is difficulty in competitive spirit is that everyone wants to be supreme. That is the difficulty." Unquote. Do not think that the competitive spirit was not present in the governing body. It most definitely was. The controversy indirectly being referred to here stemmed from a German GBC man pushing his own candidate, another German, for the post of temple president, despite the fact that the other candidate from him was fully qualified of English birth and was backed by the majority of the temple members. Cutthroat competition is not transcendental competition. The competition referred to here in this excerpt from Prabhupada indicates strongly that the non-transcendental variety was in the ascendant at Bhaktivedanta Manor during that particular crisis. However, the excerpt is also important in that it supplements what was made clear in that excerpt to the Bombay president, that letter, the local president and not the GBC was supposed to be in charge of any given center, his center. In a letter to a governing body commissioner dated December 16, 1974, the actual status of the GBC men was discussed and not in a favorable light. Quote, but the difficulty is that our GBC men are falling victim to Maya Today I trust this GBC, and tomorrow he will fall down. That's the difficulty. 
unless this problem is solved, whatever we may resolve, it will not be very useful. We shall discuss this at our meeting. If the GBC men can ever manage properly, then I shall get some time for writing my books." Unquote. <laughs> Certainly well short of a vote of confidence, was it not? Also, one of the chief reasons that the GBC was created in the first place, if not the chief reason, was to provide Prabhupada a great deal of extra time away from management issues that he would otherwise be forced to deal with on a daily basis. It didn't play out that way, however. By mid-1975, about two years before he decided to depart physical manifestation, politics within the GBC continued unabated. Indeed, it was increasing to the point that Prabhupada was concerned that his GBC would follow the same path as the Asara Gaudiamat. This is confirmed in an excerpt from a letter to one of his governing body commissioners dated September 30th, 1975. Quote, Why is there this politics? This is not good. If politics come, then the preaching will be stopped. That is the difficulty. As soon as politics come, everything is spoiled. In the Gaudiya Mutt, the politics is still going on. My Guru Maharaj left in 1936 and now it is 1976, so after 40 years the litigation is still going on. Do not come to this." Unquote. Internecine politics did not abate in the next two years and then it exploded in the years subsequent to Prabhupada's departure. Please note in his clear statement in that excerpt, quote, as soon as politics comes, everything is spoiled, unquote. Everything was spoiled. And the new unauthorized GBC protocols entered in the 80s, although they were exerting some malefic influence previously to that time. Now, a couple of months later in our continuation of these four excerpts, in November of the same year, Prabhupada wrote the following to a different GBC man, quote, if you disturb me, then my mind will be disturbed. I want that what I have established may go on nicely, but I see that some of the devotees are reviving their old good qualities. That is the difficulty. If the old habits come back, then everything is finished." Unquote. By the end of 1975, things were moving retrograde as far as the GBC was concerned. It was already becoming the vitiated GBC to a limited extent, foreshadowing what it would become in early 1978 with the imposition of the disastrous Zonal Acharya scheme. Now, did you notice that one chief common thread in each of those four important excerpts? It was literally spelled out in the exact same way. Quote, that is the difficulty, unquote. So although what was discussed in each excerpt was certainly related to some extent, was everything exactly the same that Prabhupada was objecting to in those letters? No, in one sense that was not the case. However, in another sense it was. What was being discussed in each of the four excerpts, what was exactly alike in each of them, was one thing alone, the G B C. Either the GBC was being criticized directly or the letter was written in a criticism to a GBC man. As such, it is logical to conclude that when Prabhupada stated, quote, that is the difficulty, unquote, the reference was to 
the GBC itself. Call it now the vitiated GBC. What was the difficulty? That was the difficulty. And that remains the difficulty. The unstated or sometimes semi-stated particles are the codes underlying the power node of the fabricated so-called ISCON confederation. These codes are conducive to maintaining its facade of spiritual authority. It also maintains its mysterium via its codes. Secrecy has always been what the GBC was about. From their self-serving perspective, they were the special men who directed and continued to direct the movement in a special way that must remain a mystery. Thus, they are wrongly considered to be spiritual authorities. However, neither the GBC or Gregor nor any of the individuals constituting its body on the material plane have even a shred of spiritual or devotional authority. What they have instead is P O W E R power. And misuse of that power via their previous opportunity to guide the institution in the right way has caused all kinds of difficulties and will continue to cause them. The astral smell of the vitiated GBC is most unpleasant. Here's but one example of the GBC's penchant for secrecy. Quote, The whole thing appeared to be giving all power to a Rishi. I cannot understand why, instead of one GBC man, a person outside the commission was given so much power and there was to be immediate action without divulging the matter to the devotees. And I am surprised that none of the GBC members detected the defects in the procedure. It was detected only when it came to me. What will happen when I am not here? Shall everything be spoiled by GBC?" Unquote. This well-known excerpt from a letter to Hunk Seduta, Hunk Seduta happened to be one of the ringleaders of that early 1972 centralization scheme via an ad hoc GBC meeting in New York City. That, that letter never came to light during the 70s. The rank and file never knew about it. Like so many letters with similar information, it was kept away from the devotees and shrouded in secrecy. Indeed, hardly any of the rank and file knew that Prabhupada suspended the GBC and transferred all power back to the temple presidents in April of 1972 as a result of that New York centralization scheme. The individual GBC men were also secretive about what was communicated to them in letters from His Divine Grace. Copies of all those letters were kept in a locked vault at the Los Angeles Temple by the SoCal Commissioner. When a whistleblower in the mid-80s was able to access them via a friend who smuggled them out, that whistleblower, Su Lochan, eventually assassinated, as you all know, was threatened by the SoCal commissioner in very egregious language that if he did not immediately return those letters, or worse yet, if he made known what was written in them to the devotees and public at large, he would be punished severely. Yet once he did just that, it turned out there was no mystery in those letters. There was no confidential knowledge in them. There were no confidential plans or predictions or prophecies in those letters. There was nothing in them that merited secrecy. The reason that the leaders of so-called ISKCON in general and the governing body commissioner of SoCal in particular kept the letters secret was simple. They revealed how displeased
pleased. Prabhupada was with his leaders. The letters are loaded with expression of his displeasure with them, with their decisions and their misuse of the power and authority which he had delegated to them. The letters that were kept secret, sometimes in striking detail, also reveal how displeased he often was with the governing body commission, the source of so much difficulty. Prabhupada's letters proved that the GBC men were not nearly as special as they thought they were. However, as time went on in the 70s, the vitiated GBC egregor started to gain power on its own more and more. Meant originally as an advisory board, it gradually transformed into something else. Now, you need to know that there was always a power block within which the GBC was controlled. And there was always one individual GBC who was the nucleus of that power block. In other words, instead of working on becoming an advanced Vaishnava via heavy tapasya and seva, a handful of men instead concentrated on controlling the GBC, becoming Lord of the Rings, culminating in Lord of the Ultimate Ring. There was always internecine struggles going on between and amongst some of the cult leaders throughout the 70s, but control of the GBC was, figuratively speaking, comparable to carrying a gun to a knife fight in those battles. At this time, the luster of the GBC, which was always nothing more than a dull shine from a gold-plated alloy, that luster is diminishing considerably. Your host speaker is partially responsible for that development. Yet, so-called ISKCON knew that bureaucracy could only be a placeholder in order to buffer the real perpetrator. The root issues all stem from the GBC and its concocted protocols, read codes, and those are being exposed at an increasing rate at this time. The GBC wings it via fix it as you go and its buffers are bureaucracy. Via that and other Machiavellian tactics it floats above the turmoil, a turmoil that it creates in most cases, and it constantly rains down upon the devotees at large still caught in the factory. It remains almost unseen when it's the source of these problems. It floats semi-visible because almost oh, no one dares to look up and pull away the veil and see it for just what it is. The center cannot hold if it is dependent upon bureaucracy. Here's what Prabhupada had to say about bureaucracy in his movement, which was at that time only the nose of the camel in his tent. At this time, the camel is fully in that tent, and it's not his anymore. In a letter to Karandar, dated December 22, 1972, quote, Krishna consciousness movement is for training men to be independently thoughtful and competent in all types of departments of knowledge and action, not for making bureaucracy. Once there is bureaucracy, the whole thing will be spoiled." Unquote. We all know that so-called ISKCON is chock full of Hinduization and bureaucracy because it had to take shelter of something that could keep its momentum moving especially when it was exposed decades ago. Through acquiescing to the Hindu hodgepodge and resorting to bureaucracy, it has temporarily been able to keep up some kind of revenue flow and horizontal expansion with no vertical expansion. Now perhaps some of you know this book, 
Matthew Brady's Illustrated History of the Civil War. It contains over 700 photographs, many of them stunningly graphic, illustrating what went on just previous to the outbreak, during the war, and then in the aftermath. It's a very old book, and it was commissioned by the U.S. government. As such, it is inimical to the Southern Confederacy. The first chapter more or less begins with a legal proposal in the form of a Senate bill in the United States Congress to annex both the Nebraska and Kansas territories. This included how such a proposed annexation was to be handled concerning whether those territories would be free or slave states once admitted to the Union. In chapter one of this analysis from that book of the American Civil War, in the fourth and fifth paragraphs we find the following entry, quote, the bill provided to the inhabitants of those territories to decide for themselves whether slavery should or should not exist within their domain. That proposed nullification of the Missouri Compromise produced rancorous controversies in and out of Congress, and the people of the free labor states became violently excited. After long and bitter discussion in both houses of Congress, the bill became a law. In the light of historic events, it is clear today that men who afterward appeared as leaders in the war against our government were then concocting and executing schemes for the extension of the domains of the slave system. It must expand or suffocate." Unquote. This same principle applies to so-called discount. It must expand or crater. If there is one thing that its leaders are expert in, it is in sweeping the root issues from 1978 under the rug and kicking the can down the road. They do so by adopting the fix-it-as-you-go measures in order to create a thin ice reality that their movement must be legitimate because its members and numbers are still expanding. They all know that the third transformation, the Hinduization of so-called ISKCON, is bogus, but it buys them more time until people catch on. They all know that the bureaucratic flim-flam that they have concocted will eventually be seen for what it is and rejected, but at this time it buys them more time to formulate the next fourth transformation in order to divert uh, attention away from the realization that so-called ISKCON is an operation built on sand. It is our duty to confront them and not let them continue to get away with their deviations. They must be known, those deviations. To confront them means to confront the vitiated GBC. To confront the vitiated GBC means to confront its unauthorized protocols. In that confrontation, you will realize how illusory all of those codes are and their operation will eventually collapse. When the protocols collapse, the vitiated GBC will begin to collapse and then the ISCON show bottle company will go into debt, into receivership, will cease to expand and a due course crater. That is sorely wanted. However, first you must look up through the pouring rain of deviation and see that floating GBC for just what it is. Through the bottom of pain Occasionally glancing up through the rain Wondering which of the brothers to blame And watching For pigs on the wing The colossal hoax, known as the fabricated so-called 
ISKCON Confederation is a pseudo-spiritual scam. It is controlled by a power node known as the vitiated GBC, that power node being loaded with concocted protocols meant for complete control. It is also loaded with bureaucracy and centralization, all counter to the wishes of its founder Acharya, the founder Acharya of the real Hare Krishna movement branch in the West. What was Prabhupada's conclusion about the governing body and its members' qualification to spiritually lead his movement? For the crystal clear answer, consider this excerpt from a letter to one of his senior men dated November 10, 1975. Quote, now has GBC become more than Guru Maharaj, as if simply GBC is meant for looking after pounds, shilling, pence? The GBC does not look after spiritual life. That is a defect. All of our students will have to become guru, but they are not qualified. This is the difficulty. Sadeva Samya.